Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. Today we are picking back up with the case of missing 13-year-old Nicholas Barclay who reportedly returned home after three years and he had a terrifying story and he had a drastically changed appearance. I mean, even his eye color was different. He had aged a lot in that three years, but the poor kid had been through so much terror. He had lived through the unthinkable, so his family didn't question the changes in him too much. They were just really happy to have him home. Now, if you have not seen part one of this series, I highly encourage you to watch that first because if you don't, Literally none of this will make sense. I have linked that in the description box along with links to my social media, Twitter, Instagram, along with links to my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with retired police detective Derek Lavasser, who also happens to be a Big Brother winner. Check out Crime Weekly if you haven't. Right now, Derek and I are covering the case of the Springfield 3 on the podcast. It's a great case to really dig into the details. It's been highly requested, so check that out if you haven't already. I've also linked our coffee brand, Criminal Coffee Company, which is the best coffee you'll ever taste, and I stand by that. I'm really looking forward to diving into the second part of this series because this has been a wild ride. And from the comments from part one, I know that you guys agree, but I really want to remind you all again to focus on Nicholas Barclay, the real Nicholas Barclay, right? Who to this day is still missing. Because of all the insanity and confusion, everyone really lost focus on Nicholas. But you would think that after discovering the guy pretending to be Nicholas wasn't Nicholas at all, it would have really like breathed life into the investigation, right? And we would have figured out what happened to Nicholas by now, or we would have had some kind of inclination, some kind of clue, some kind of path to follow. Now, there are theories about what happened to Nicholas, which we are going to get into in this video, but the poor kid still hasn't been brought home one way or the other, and it's incredibly sad to me. Uh, very sad. So I'm kind of like hoping that there's still a chance that somebody might say something, something might happen, something might be discovered, and we can get uh, a conclusion to what happened to Nicholas. Okay, before we dive in today, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV. If you're like me and you love documentaries the way that I do, you've probably already exhausted most of your documentary options on streaming platforms. Maybe you've even watched some of them twice. Michael Peterson and The Staircase, I am looking at you. I know parts of that documentary by heart. It's really odd, but it's true. That's why you guys should try Magellan TV, a documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers. Magellan TV has more true crime documentaries than any other platform, and every week they add 15 to 20 hours of new content so you'll never run out of something to watch. And I know I usually suggest a true crime option for you, but I've recently been binging a Magellan TV history series that I'm obsessed with, and I would highly suggest that you check it out. It's called Called Monarchy with David Starkey, and the series has 16 episodes, which is what drew me to it in the first place, because you know with me, you know, the longer the better. I actually started watching this uh, series at the gym on the treadmill for my motivation entertainment, which is pretty much um, something I like watching, but I save it for the gym so that I go to the gym, and <laughs> it does actually work, but literally... I could not save this for the gym. After a few episodes, I definitely cheated, and I had to find a new motivation entertainment option. So Monarchy. This series tells the story of the oldest surviving political institution in Europe, the British Monarchy, and it starts at the Dark Ages, and it goes all the way to modern times. It's so, so good. You can find this series and so much more right now on Magellan TV, which is completely ad-free. It can be watched anytime, anywhere on your television, cell phone, tablet, or laptop. It's also compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. They have amazing history, true crime, science, nature, 
and travel documentaries that will keep you entertained and educated for hours. And with an annual membership of just $59.98 a year, you will only pay $4.99 a month for 3,500 hours worth of amazing documentaries. Over 3,500 hours worth. And if you click the link in my description box, you can try Magellan TV out for yourself for one month free. No strings attached, no contracts to sign. You can cancel anytime you want, but I really don't think you're going to want to. Once you get in there, you're going to get hooked. Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video, and let's dive in. Okay, at the end of the last episode, I revealed to you that the person who was claiming to be a 16-year-old Nicholas Barclay was in fact not Nicholas. I think that this should have been fairly obvious to everyone, considering this dude looked nothing like Nicholas. He looked nothing like any 16-year-old I've ever seen because he always had a 5 o'clock shadow and he must have been shaving like every day to prevent his face from breaking out into a full beard. And he didn't even act like Nicholas, right? But for some reason, this was not that obvious to the people who knew and loved him, besides maybe his older half-brother, Jason, who clearly did not buy the story from the moment he heard Nicholas was coming back home. Why is it so obvious to us watching, but not to Nicholas's family in the moment? Is it hindsight? Is it context? Is it because they so badly wanted to believe that this person was Nicholas, so they saw what they wanted? They thought what they wanted? They felt what they wanted? I don't know. I think uh, we'll save that discussion for the end of this episode. But I have another question for you, a question about Jason, Nicholas's older half-brother. Did Jason not buy the story because he thought it was unbelievable? Was he kind of like us, thinking like, this guy's not Nicholas? Did he not believe it because he saw how different Nicholas looked and he noticed that Nicholas spoke with a pretty noticeable French accent? Or did Jason not buy it because he actually knew what had happened to the real Nicholas? So there was no possible way that this guy could be the real Nicholas. But before we go into that rabbit hole, let's answer the question of who the man pretending to be Nicholas was. The guy who was literally living in the home of Nicholas's sister, the guy who was going to high school, where apparently none of the adults there were taken aback by his appearance either. It's just so bizarre. Every time I keep talking about it, every time I think about it, it's so bizarre. He's going to high school with teenagers. Imagine the safety concerns. Imagine you're a parent at that high school and you find out that this grown ass man from a different country pretending to be a 16 year old boy was attending classes with your teenagers and talking to your daughter Amy on the phone and they had like a relationship. <laughs> OK, so this was not Nicholas Barclay. This was a 23 year old French man named Frederick Bourdin who's known to Interpol as the chameleon. As I said at the top of the last episode, I went through all sorts of emotions when researching this case, and I am not an unfeeling person. Some of you might think I am, but I'm not. I have a heart. I don't talk about my feelings a lot or show them a lot, but that doesn't mean they aren't there. They are all the time, a lot of them. Like an overwhelming amount of feelings are inside of me all the time. Now, as always, I'm going to be very upfront and honest with you guys about how I'm feeling. Um, if you don't like it, you don't like it. This is how I'm feeling. I can't adjust how I'm feeling to, to suit everybody's needs and desires. But I think what Frederick Bourdin did was wrong. Obviously, it was wrong, right? Objectively, what he did was wrong. But... He didn't kidnap Nicholas Barclay. He didn't kill Nicholas Barclay. So while I can openly say that pretending to be Nicholas was, like I said, objectively messed up, I also found myself feeling for this guy as I went through his life. And I actually saw a lot of parallels between Frederick Bourdin and Nicholas Barclay, who I also have so much sympathy for in my heart. And you may judge me for that. You may be like, ew, Stephanie, Frederick's a criminal. He tricked people. He assumed the identity of a missing boy, which may have compromised the investigation into Nicholas's actual whereabouts. And to that I say, what investigation? Who the hell was actually out there looking for that 13-year-old boy? Who the hell seemed to actually care that much about him? before he went missing. Am I angry about this? 
It seemed that Nicholas's family really normalized that he was just a bad apple that they couldn't control, that he was just running the streets, stealing stuff, getting into trouble, causing problems in the household. But in my opinion, there were already problems in the household, problems that started long before Nicholas was born. Or Nicholas wouldn't have been acting like that in the first place. That's my opinion. His own family didn't even report him missing for three days. The police were like, yeah, he hasn't been home. He didn't take any clothes or money. But the kid's bad news, and he's been known to do this, so what do you really expect us to do? By the time Frederick Bourdine was claiming to be Nicholas, three years had passed, There was no one looking for that kid. So let's be really honest with ourselves. And if we're being really honest with ourselves, we can admit that we wouldn't even know the name Nicholas Barclay if not for Frederick Bourdain. So for that, Frederick, I am grateful to you. And honestly, I think there's a hell of a lot more people out there now who know about Nicholas's disappearance and who may say something, see something, or try to locate him because of what Frederick Bourdain did. And additionally, you know, I can't help who I feel for. I can't help who tugs on my heartstrings. You know, my sympathy for Frederick may seem hypocritical to you because I always say it doesn't matter what happened in your past. Many people who have rocky childhoods still go on to make the decisions to not hurt anyone else, and they still stand by that. Since we know for a fact Frederick Bourdain was not involved with Nicholas actually going missing, the only people that he potentially hurt were Nicholas's family members by pretending to be their loved one. But there is a strong possibility, in my opinion, and the opinions of many others, including Frederick Bourdain himself, that they might have already known he wasn't Nicholas right from the get-go. And we're going to look at this objectively. We're going to look at this unbiasedly. Unbiasedly? Is that a word? It's got to be. And, you know, we're going to have a discussion in the comment section, and I'm going to kind of, like, give my final thoughts at the end and, and try to be fair. But who is... Frederick Bourdain. He was born on June 13th, 1974 in Nantes, France, which is a suburb of Paris. His mother, Ghislaine, was 18 years old and struggling financially when she gave birth to her son. And on his birth certificate, there is an X where his father's name should have been. Now, it was reported that Ghislaine did not know who Frederick's father was, But in a later interview with The New Yorker, she claimed that she'd been seeing a man that she worked with at the margarine factory. This man was a 25-year-old Algerian immigrant named Casey, with a K. And Ghislaine said she doesn't remember what his last name was, but when she became pregnant, she found out that Casey already had a wife and a family. So she left, she quit her job at the margarine factory without telling him that she was carrying his child. Ghislaine raised Frederick until he was two years old, at which point he was removed from her care and put in the custody of his grandparents by child services. Now, Ghislaine claims she doesn't know why this happened, and she felt that her child had been stolen from her. She said at this point she had a job in a factory, she was a good mother, so she felt there was no reason why she would have been seen as unfit. And it looks like Child Protective Services, or whatever they're called in France, I'm sure it's the same concept, they came and took Frederick away on behalf of Ghislaine's parents. So the parents, or the grandparents of Frederick, they said she's not a good mom, you know, she's not taking care of her kid, and that's why Child Services went there and and probably did an investigation. And a relative of Ghislaine's said, quote, she liked to drink and dance and stay out all night. She didn't want anything to do with that child, end quote. It's one of those he said, she said things, right? Um, who's telling the truth, who's exaggerating, who's trying to make themselves look better, we don't know. But I do think that there was probably an investigation done, and if Child Protective Services had found that everything was peachy keen, maybe they wouldn't have taken the child. But I don't live in France, and I didn't live in France in the 1970s, so if anybody out there did, let me know what the process would have been like. But it seemed like Ghislaine um, cared about Frederick in, in a way. She definitely wanted him to think she cared about him. She definitely wanted him to be in her life in some way, shape, or form because she would later write a letter to her son where she said, quote, You are my son 
and they stole you from me at the age of two. They did everything to separate us from each other, and now we have become two strangers, end quote. So sad. I'm going to talk about Frederick's relationship with his mother a little bit more in a minute. When he was five, Frederick moved with his grandparents to Mao Champs outside of Nantes, and he didn't have a great time there because... It was kind of a really tiny and tight-knit village, and he was an outsider from the moment he arrived. The other kids would make fun of him because he'd been taken away from his mother, because he wore hand-me-down clothes that were, you know, usually too big for him. They didn't fit him properly as hand-me-down clothes don't. They also made fun of him because he didn't know who his father was. And so Frederick, he began to invent stories about himself and his past to sort of fill in the blanks, maybe a little bit for him, but also to make him seem less like a sad orphan and more like an interesting person who was in these circumstances because of some, you know, dramatic fate, not because he just came from a bad family and he had a bad start to life. Frederick claimed his father wasn't around because he was a British secret agent and he was being kept in Mao Champs for his own safety to hide from people who were looking for his father. In an interview with The Telegraph, Frederick Bourdine said that from that moment, he always played fast and loose with the facts because, quote, when I was young, the truth didn't give me love. It gave me hate, end quote. So sad. And it also didn't help that Frederick was of Algerian descent. So reportedly, other parents wouldn't let their children play with him, and his own grandfather thought he was less than because of it. And Frederick claimed that his grandfather was violent and abusive towards his own wife and his own children, probably also towards Frederick, which may explain some of the old injuries that were mentioned in that previous episode. Remember, Carrie's husband said that the kid he thought was Nicholas, he had a a broken hand that looked like it had never healed correctly. He had cigarette burns on his neck and legs. So what I'm trying to point out here is Frederick Bourdine clearly at some point went through some type of abuse, most likely as a child. However, one of Frederick's teachers, a man named Yvonne Bourgil, saw the good in the little boy with the wild stories. Bourgil said that Frederick was precocious and captivating, and he had an extraordinary imagination and visual sense. The young Frederick would spend hours drawing vivid and beautiful comic strips that could also at times be disturbing. And Ivan Borgil said that Frederick had a way of, quote, making you connect to him. So he sort of has always had this since he was a young kid, this ability to relate to others, to have others relate to him, a sort of charisma, you know, maybe a little bit of manipulation, but a manipulation wrapped in a really charming charisma. But there was a lot going on beneath the surface for Frederick, which most likely led to future behavioral issues. Frederick claimed that at the age of eight, he was molested by a neighbor. And from that point on, he was terrified of this person, but it was never reported or investigated. In an interview with The Guardian, Frederick claimed that his grandmother didn't want a scandal. And he said, quote, when you're made ashamed of who you are by the people who are supposed to love you, if they make you understand that you're shit, then you want to be something that they will be proud of, that they would love. You dream of being somebody else, end quote. In one of his comic strips he was drawing at this time, Frederick illustrated himself drowning in a river. He began acting out in school. He was stealing from the neighbors. And I mean, who does that sound like? Nicholas Barclay, right? This is exactly who it sounds like. And when Frederick was 12, his grandparents had reached the end of their patience with him. They sent him to live at a juvenile facility in Nantes. Once again, who does this sound like? This sounds like Nicholas Barclay. Because Nicholas was 13, he was acting out, he had to go to court for stealing, and the court was going to decide what happens with you next. And his mother, Beverly, was saying, like, at that point, once he went to court, it was probably going to be that he went to juvie or something like that because I could no longer handle him. I couldn't do anything for him. So Frederick also gets sent away to a juvenile facility in Nantes, and the teachers at this facility would report that Frederick would make up wild stories, wilder stories than he had ever been coming up with in his childhood. And they said he would sometimes pretend to have amnesia and, like, wander the streets 
getting lost on purpose so that somebody could find him and he could be like, oh, I don't have any memory. I don't know who I am or where I'm from. When Frederick turned 16 in 1990, he was moved to a different facility for older children, but he hated it there, so he ran away and he hitchhiked to Paris. Or he hitched to Paris. Or he, yeah, he hitchhiked to Paris. But the cold streets of Paris, they're not kind to a kid who has no money, no parents, and no past. You've seen Les Mis, right? Mm -mm. And you might ask yourself, why didn't he reconnect with his mother? His mother's in Paris, right? Why didn't he find his mother? Why didn't they, you know, get back together? There was no one coming between them, no one keeping them apart any longer. Well, they had a complicated relationship. Although Frederick did seem to seek his mother's approval and love all his life, even when he was pretending to be Nicholas Barclay in Texas, he actually called his mother when he was in Texas, and he told her, you know, I just want to let you know I'm okay. I'm living with the family of a missing boy in the United States. Like, I miss you. Even though he still kind of wanted her to love him the way that he loved her, Frederick felt that his mother was always disturbed, and she still is. He claims to remember being slapped by her when he was a baby. He said she would slap him and slap him harder, and then suddenly she would grab him and hug him, telling him that she loved him. And this is hard to hear, right? Because this is physical abuse. It's also emotional and psychological abuse. It's confusing to a young child. It's confusing because the parent, the trusted adult, is hurting you and then immediately afterwards apologizing. And you you almost start to connect hurt and violence and abuse to love when those things are repeated, when those patterns are repeated. And it's the violence and the hurt followed immediately by apologeticness and love. According to childwelfare.gov, childhood maltreatment can be linked to later physical, psychological, and behavioral consequences as well as cost to a society as a whole. For example, abuse or neglect may stunt physical development of the child's brain and lead to psychological problems such as low self-esteem, which could later lead to high-risk behaviors such as substance abuse. I mean, this is a really great article, actually, that I have read before. I've bookmarked. I've never shared it with you guys before, but I'm going to now. I'll link it in the description box. It's called Long-Term Consequences of Child Abuse and Neglect. And it talks about even how, you know, patterns of child abuse can change your genetic expression. And it can have, like, intergenerational long-term consequences. It's crazy. It's very, very important as a parent to make sure you don't screw your kid up before they even have a chance to figure out who they are and what the world's about and what their place in it is. It's very important you don't screw them up. Like, it's a lot of pressure as a parent, right? But it's really not that, that hard if you think about it. Don't hit your kids, right? A, point A, the basic building block of not being a shitty person. And, you know, two, just like don't make them feel like crap. <laughs> always try to encourage them. Always try to make sure that they're developing a really healthy sense of self. And during the times when you are wrong, apologize. You know, I'm sorry. Mommy was wrong. Adults aren't perfect. Things like that. But the thing that's really difficult to apologize for is that physical abuse, because those two things can later become linked in the child's brain, like I said. And Frederick claimed that on the few occasions he did see his mother after being removed from her custody, she would pretend to be really sick, like on her deathbed, and he would walk in and she'd scream at him like, oh, I'm dying, you know, go get help. And he would run and get the neighbors. And then, you know, he'd come back with help and she'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm fine. And Frederick believes that she did this to scare him and to put herself in the position of always being the victim. Maybe this would make him feel guilty about not being with her. Maybe this would compel him to, you know, think about her and want to return to her so he could care for her. Maybe she just wanted the attention. 
But regardless, when Frederick went to Paris at the age of 16, he did not go to his mother for help or comfort. Instead, he created his first fake identity. He told a police officer in the street that he was Jimmy Sale, a fictional lost British teenager. And he said he did this hoping that the officials would, you know, just send him to England because he'd imagined that his life could be really beautiful there. Like it was a great country and he wanted to live there. But, you know... Apparently, the UK isn't like America, where we'll just be like, oh, you're Nicholas Barclay? Here's your passport. Come on down. But the police quickly realized that Frederick barely spoke any English, and he was swiftly returned to the youth home he had escaped from, but he would just run away again. For the next seven years, Frederick went from place to place all around Europe, going in and out of over 100 youth homes and children's shelters. And these weren't youth homes that he was put in. I want to be really clear about that. These were youth homes that he you know, basically lied his way into so that he could be taken care of. He was there by choice, and he always used the same routine. He would go to a phone booth and call the police, pretending to be a concerned citizen or a tourist passing by. He would say that there was a young boy wandering the streets, usually 13 or 14 years old, and then the police would arrive. At that point, Frederick Bourdine would pose as the child he had called in the report about. He would give them different names, different backstories, but it was always, you know, similar in the fact that he was a young boy who was lost and needed help. He said, quote, every single day, every single week, every single month of my life, my only work was trying to get people to care for me. The only way I've known how to do that is being 14 years old. If you find good people, they will try to help you. If you don't have love, there's nothing left. That's what I dreamt, that people would understand me. My life wasn't made out of evil. It wasn't made so I will get some kind of money. Just love. That's all I wanted. I wanted it for me, end quote. And it is true. As far as we know, Frederick Bourdine never stole from anyone. He never hurt anyone. And every time they asked him what he wanted, he would tell the home or the youth center that all he wanted was a family, a place to sleep, and a school. But as it was to be expected, at each of these places he stayed, he would usually be found out. They would discover he wasn't the person he was claiming to be. The person he was claiming to be didn't even exist. And as soon as he felt that people were putting two and two together, he would take off. And he would repeat his process somewhere else because he said, quote, I'd rather leave on my own than be taken away, end quote. By 1995, Frederick's antics had become known around France and Europe. Interpol was looking into him, and the media were trying to locate him to find out what his story was. A popular French television show called Everything is Possible was able to convince him to be on their program and tell his tale. And the show and their producers, they were so moved by his story that he only wanted love and family, they actually offered him a job in their newsroom. But... Frederick hadn't said he wanted a job, right? He said love and family, and they gave him a job. He didn't want a job. That was never one of the things he said he wanted when he was going to the youth homes. And obviously, you know, his personality where he constantly needs to be moving, he constantly needs to be, like, creating these identities. I think because of what happened to him in his childhood, Frederick quickly grew bored with this job and this normal life, and he moved on again. Now, I want to read you a passage from an article in The New Yorker written by a reporter who actually sat down and talked to Frederick. It says, quote, One day when I was visiting Bourdine, he described how he transformed himself into a child, like the imposters he had seen in films such as Catch Me If You Can. He tried to elevate his criminality into an art. First, he said, he conceived of a child whom he wanted to play. Then he gradually mapped out the character's biography from his heritage to his family to his tics. The key is actually not lying about everything, Bourdain said. Otherwise, you'll just mix things up. He said that he had adhered to maxims such as keep it simple and a good liar uses the truth. In choosing a name, he preferred one that carried a deep association in his memory, like Cassis. The one thing you better not forget is your name, he said. He compared what he did to being a spy. You changed superficial details while keeping your core intact. This approach not only made it easier to convince people, it allowed him to protect a part of himself. 
to hold on to some moral center. I know I can be cruel, but I don't want to become a monster, he said. Once he had imagined a character, he fashioned a commensurate appearance, meticulously shaving his face, plucking his eyebrows, using hair removal creams. He often put on baggy pants and a shirt with long sleeves that swallowed his wrists, emphasizing his smallness. Peering in a mirror, he asked himself if others would see what he wanted them to see. The worst thing you can do is deceive yourself, he said. End quote. And that is how Frederick Bourdin came to be in a Leonardo's youth home in 1997. He was the one who had made the call to the police, claiming to have seen a young boy wandering around the streets distressed and alone. There was no young boy. The young boy was him, and he was also the person calling to say he saw a young boy. But this was the first time he would take on the identity of a real person instead of one he had created in his own vivid imagination. He knew that if the police could not figure out who he was, they would eventually have to put him in a children's home, which is exactly what he wanted. So when he's in the police station, he's not telling them who he is because he doesn't have any like answer. He hasn't made anybody up at this point, and he doesn't know who he can be that's a real person. So he wants to get to the youth home, and from there he's going to figure it out. At the youth home, he would pretend to be a child who needed to be cared for, and that's what, you know, he felt he needed more than anything, to be cared for. Since he was smaller in stature, you know, kind of short and skinnier, even though he doesn't look that way in the pictures, right, compared to 13-year-old Nicholas, (laughs) Frederick Bourdain pretending to be Nicholas, he's like broad shoulders, he's hulking, he looks huge. But I guess Frederick was a little bit smaller Uh, for his age, and so he could easily pretend to be younger than his 23 years old. But what Frederick didn't know at that time was that in Leonaris, Spain, they didn't just let a kid with no identity card hang out in a youth home, and he claims that this was rare. Like, in all the places he'd been in Europe, he usually would just say he didn't remember who he was or he would make up some fake name, and they would let him stay there until, you know, they figured it out, which could be weeks or months but not in Leonaris. And so he was told that he needed to tell them exactly who he was, and if he couldn't, they were going to have him fingerprinted. And he knew at that point he'd probably be arrested for lying to the police. So Frederick had to come up with a quick plan, and I mean quick. He did this on the fly. He told the people at the youth home that he was an American kid who had run away from home, and he would call his family so they could come get him, but he needed to do this in private. So he was shown into an office where he was told he could use the phone there to call his parents. But Frederick didn't call his parents. He called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Virginia, and he pretended to be Jonathan Durian. Once again, no such person as Jonathan Durian. That person doesn't exist. That was Frederick Bourdain. Once Frederick had Nicholas Barclay's missing person poster faxed over, he quickly made the decision that he could pull this off. He could become Nicholas Barclay because they did have like sort of similar features such as the gap between the two front teeth and kind of the same chin. But here's the problem. The poster was faxed over, which means it was in black and white, probably not super clear, real grainy, real bad quality. And the woman from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Virginia was like, hey, it's not going to be the best quality, but I promise I'll overnight you the full colored version of the poster to the youth home so you can like double check and make sure. But by the time that arrived, Frederick had already alerted the San Antonio police that Nicholas Barclay was in Spain. And Nicholas's sister, Carrie, was already on a plane headed towards him. And it was when he had the full color picture of Nicholas Barclay that Frederick realized he was in big trouble because this boy had, you know, sandy blonde hair and blue eyes and Frederick had brown hair and brown eyes. And it's kind of funny because when Frederick explains this in the documentary, he's basically laughing at himself. He's like, I don't I don't know what to do at this point. And he says, quote, he looked nothing like me, nothing The only thing he had in common with me was that he had five fingers on each hand. So he agrees with you guys because there's a lot of people in the comment section from part one who were like, his nose doesn't even look the same. Like, what's his sister talking about? The noses are completely different. Frederick Bourdain agreed. The only thing he and Nicholas Barclay had in common pretty much were that they had five fingers on each hand. So he went out, he got some stuff to bleach his hair, and he enlisted the help of a young girl who was also at the youth home to replicate Nicholas's tattoos on Frederick. 
But even with all of this, Frederick was still incredibly doubtful that once Carrie arrived, she would believe that he was her brother. And he was like, I'm definitely going to be arrested. Like, as soon as she lays eyes on me, it's over. Which is why he was absolutely stunned when he met Carrie for the first time. He says in the documentary, quote, She didn't even wait a second or two seconds. She jumped on me. She took me in her arms and she said, You were afraid I wouldn't recognize you. I remember that nose. She said, Don't worry. Everything is going to be fine. Only God knows why she would do something like that. But I know one thing for sure is there was no other way. She came for me and she wanted me back. End quote. So remember, Nicholas, who we now know as Frederick, he and Carrie, they went into the visitor's room and she showed him dozens of pictures telling him who everyone was, where they were, what they were like, etc., to jog his memory. And then when he had to go in front of the judge to prove he was actually Nicholas, they tested him with five of those same pictures. And according to Frederick, quote, I would not have been able to do anything if Carrie didn't show me those pictures, end quote. Frederick said that he considered running away after this, but he also felt that maybe there was a good opportunity here. He said that Carrie seemed like a really nice person. She must really have loved her brother. She must really have, you know, wanted to bring him back into the fold and into the family. And Frederick was thinking he could possibly go back with her to America and be a part of her family. So basically, he said, let it ride, you know? <laughs> Let's see what happens. He was gambling, folks. He was playing some high-stakes poker, and I guess he felt I could run away and keep doing this over and over again, what I've been doing for years, or I can try something different and see if there's a different outcome. Then, as we know, Frederick flew all the way to San Antonio, Texas with Carrie, and when they landed, he was nervous. He was nervous because he didn't really understand why Carrie hadn't realized already that he wasn't her brother, but he was sure everyone else or at least one other person would, especially Nicholas's own mother, Beverly. At this point, he knew that there was a huge possibility he was going to get found out in that airport. He was going to walk out and everybody was going to be like, who the hell are you? And then he would certainly be going to prison because, I mean, at this point, he's like impersonating someone. I mean, they made him a United States passport with his picture on it. Nicholas Barclay's name on it. He broke several laws to do this. But no, everyone just ran over and started hugging him and calling him Nicholas. And I mean, you know, it's up to you how much of Frederick Bourdain's story you believe or you want to believe. But if you watch him in the documentary, he does seem believable. But he is also like a professional liar and a really good actor. But I mean, many times in this film, he just seems as confused as everyone else as to how all of these people believed he was somebody that he didn't look anything like. He seems genuinely baffled about it. He's like, I for sure thought my goose was cooked, but they all thought I was Nicholas. So what was I going to do? You know, he went with it. He said he felt like this was his chance to not only have a family who loved and accepted him, but to do his life right, to go to school, to learn, to get a job, be a member of society, have a family, stay in the same place for longer than a couple of months or a couple of weeks. But at first, Frederick was haunted by the thought that the real Nicholas Barclay would just return while Frederick was there pretending to be him. Every day for a while, he woke up anxious thinking like this could be the day Nicholas is just going to walk through the door and everything's going to go up in flames. Nicholas is going to come home and everyone's going to look at him and, and say, who are you? Now, obviously, that was unrealistic. Nicholas has been missing for three years. Nobody's heard from him. Nobody's seen him. But because Frederick was living this fake life, that's obviously going to put like a great deal of stress and pressure on you. Um, it's going to make you paranoid. It's going to make you super anxious. You know you're doing something wrong. You know you're not being honest. And, and that puts a very heavy weight on the mind. So I guess it does make sense that Frederick would have been paranoid about this very slim possibility of Nicholas just returning as soon as Frederick gets there. But then when Charlie Parker, the private investigator, got involved and the FBI started asking for DNA and fingerprints, he knew they were closing in on him. Just as it had been in the youth homes of Europe, Frederick knew that he should confess because they were going to find out anyway. He would rather leave than be tossed out. And Charlie Parker says something in the documentary that I laughed at because 
everyone was asked in this documentary, like, why do you think Nicholas's family went along with all of this? And Charlie said maybe they wanted to believe so badly he was their son that they did. But it was starting to get ridiculous. And he says it in such a straightforward way. And that simple and obvious statement made by Charlie after seeing interviews with Beverly and Carrie and other family members who ignored all the obvious red flags that this wasn't Nicholas. It was just perfect timing, perfect comedic timing for me because it was starting to get ridiculous. It had been ridiculous. I mean, Frederick's hair was growing out dark brown, not blonde at all. Like I said, he had a five o'clock channel, man. The family is being told by private investigators and FBI agents, this isn't your son. It's not possible that it's your son. And they just refused to hear it. It was ridiculous. Frederick himself said, quote, when Beverly refused to give her blood sample, I started to become suspicious. They knew that I wasn't Nicholas. Whatever I was telling them, they didn't believe a word of it, but they were good at not showing it. I mean, who wouldn't see it? I remember in Spain, Carrie did everything for me. When I didn't know something, she told me. She wanted to put it in my head so I would never forget. She just could not say it was not Nicholas. Did she believe it or not? If you ask me, I would say no. Not for a second did she believe I was her brother. She decided I was going to be her brother. It's like I woke up in a place where there were lies even bigger than what I did. They pretended as much as I did and even more, end quote. And that's like a very impactful statement for me when he says it. And to think about that, like you... <laughs> you are an imposter. You're pretending to be somebody. You're always so stressed that you're going to be found out. And then you get to this place with these people and you're like, they think I am Nicholas. And then as time goes on, you're like, they don't think I'm Nicholas. They're playing some game here that's like at a higher level than I've ever even played. You know, I'm like wanted by Interpol. They have a name for me, the chameleon. And these people are doing some CIA level type, you know, acrobats here. Okay, so we know that Frederick Bourdain is and was not Nicholas Barclay. That was a mystery all on its own that was solved. But that left the original mystery. Where was the real Nicholas? In the documentary, they do something really smart as far as, like, filmmaking goes. They played this news clip where an anchor is saying, you know, Frederick was the only person in U.S. history to ever impersonate a missing child, and he was able to fool even the lost boy's mother. It's hard to imagine how he even got away with it. And after that clip stops playing, they, like, pan over face after face after face of people in Nicholas's family, and they're just staring at the camera. They're saying nothing. They're quiet, deep in thought. It's poignant because it's a good question, right? How did Frederick Bourdain get away with it? How did he live with his family for four months and none of them ever put two and two together? And the panning over of their faces without them saying anything is basically like this representation of, you know, these people have been talking all the whole documentary about why they thought he was and this, this and that and how happy they were. And then when the question is asked, like, how did you believe this? They ain't got nothing to say. So why was that, right? Of a question that is valid, a question that we all have. How in the world did anybody believe that Frederick Bourdain was Nicholas Barclay? They didn't look alike. He looked much older. We've gone through all of this. How did they believe this? What was the reason for this? What's the explanation? Well, according to the opinion of the imposter himself, Nicholas's family hadn't figured out the truth because they knew the truth. They knew he wasn't Nicholas because they knew what had happened to Nicholas. He was dead, and one or more of them had killed him. And Bourdine shared his theory with the San Antonio Police Department, which triggered a homicide investigation. FBI agent Nancy Fisher felt that Frederick Bourdine might be on to something. And she said, quote, if Beverly knew that this individual was not her son, then she had to have some type of ulterior motive and it had to be something very scary for her to accept a stranger into her household posing as her own son, end quote. But Beverly really didn't accept a stranger into her household, right? She didn't even really accept Nicholas into her household when he came back from Spain. She had Nicholas, quotation marks, live with his sister, Carrie, 
Maybe that's why Beverly didn't want Nicholas to live with her when he returned because he was like a stranger from Spain. And she knew that at least at Carrie's, there were several people there who could keep an eye on him. Carrie's husband was there in case, you know, Nicholas got rowdy and something needed to happen. Now, Nancy Fisher, the FBI agent, she wanted Beverly to take a polygraph exam, you know, to ask her if she had anything to do with what happened to her real son, Nicholas. And Beverly sought advice from her daughter, Carrie, on what she should do. And Carrie told her mother to take it. You know, you didn't kill Nicholas, Mom, so you've got nothing to fear. You have nothing to hide. And Beverly did take a polygraph, and she passed it, with the examiner claiming she was truthful when she answered no to the question, do you know the whereabouts of Nicholas? But Nancy Fisher was not so convinced. The examiner told Nancy that Beverly had seemed to be truthful when she answered. However, if she had been under the influence of some sort of drug, she could have been lying, and the test may have shown that she was truthful. So Nancy had Beverly stay there until any potential drugs had left her system, and then she had the examiner administer the test again. And this time, when Beverly was asked if she knew where Nicholas was and she answered no, the machine indicated she was lying. Nancy Fisher was like, the machine was going crazy, it like flew off the table, it was such a big lie. <laughs> so dramatic. The examiner told Beverly that she'd failed and, you know, she got upset. She got up, she ran out of the room, she yelled, you know, I don't have to put up with this, this is ridiculous, I'm leaving. Nancy ran after Beverly and she caught up with her and she was like, why are you running away? Why are you so upset? And Nancy claims that Beverly said, quote, this is so typical of Nicholas. Look at the hell he's putting me through, end quote. Later, Beverly did admit to a reporter from The Guardian that she had used drugs before the polygraph exam. She said she had probably consumed alcohol, heroin, and methadone. So I guess that makes sense why you would get two different results, but I don't believe in polygraph exams. Um, I think that they are absolute garbage. We're going to talk about that in a minute, though. Frederick Bourdine had also specifically claimed that he believed Nicholas's older half-brother Jason was responsible for the boy's death. So Nancy also wanted to speak to Jason, but he initially refused. Finally, after several weeks of hounding him, Jason sat down with Nancy for an interview, but he was sullen. He didn't want to speak. She said she had to pull the words out of him. She asked him why it had taken so long for him to go and see Nicholas when he had returned after three years. Wasn't he excited and eager to see his brother after he'd been gone for so long, after there had been so much guilt on Jason for his disappearance? Jason said no, he was not eager to see Nicholas. After this first interview, Jason refused to talk to Nancy or anyone investigating Nicholas's disappearance again. And a few weeks later, Jason passed away from a cocaine overdose. As we know, Jason was allegedly clean at this time. He had been at the rehabilitation facility for a year. And then after he was clean, he was counseling others. He was helping others get clean. So there was some question as to whether he had relapsed due to the pressure of the microscope being on him. Because in case you didn't know, um, which you probably wouldn't unless you were a, a heavy drug user. But if you are a heavy drug user, a long-term drug user, your, your body, your system develops a tolerance to that drug. And you start to need more and more and more of that drug in order to get the same effect uh, and feeling and high that you were getting before with less of the drug. But then if you get clean and you're, you're off drugs for an extended period of time, you might go back to drugs and start with the same dose that you had left off with. But now because that tolerance in your body is gone or lessened, that same dose that you were taking before, it might kill you. So there was a question of that. There was also a question of did Jason take his own life knowingly using that drug and knowing that it would kill him um, in order to avoid the investigation, worried what they would find in the investigation, et cetera. Now, Beverly was asked, you know, do you think your son Jason took his own life? And she said she didn't know. Beverly also maintains to this day that she had nothing to do with what happened to Nicholas, saying, quote, when they accused me, I freaked out. I worked my ass off to raise my kid. Why would I do something to my kids? I'm not a violent person. They didn't talk to any of my friends or associates. It was just a shot in the dark to see if I'd admit something. I'm the world's worst liar. I can't lie worth crap, end quote. And I do agree with her there, not about her being the world's worst liar. 
I'm sure she might be a bad liar, but the world's worst liar, that probably goes to somebody else like Casey Anthony, Dahlia DiPolito, um, Letitia Stauk, the list goes on and on. But what I'm saying is I understand that she was probably like stressed out and anxious while she took that polygraph. You know, clearly four years after Nicholas's disappearance, there wasn't going to be any solid physical evidence to tie Beverly to whatever had happened to him, even if she had been involved. And like I said, I've never put much stock in polygraph exams, and I know that they are used more for tools of interrogation than anything else, and the results usually aren't allowed in court because they're not reliable. And when she says that, like, they were just trying to get me to confess to something, they put me on that polygraph to get me to confess to something that I didn't do, I 100% believe that's exactly what happened. And when she passed that first polygraph... Nancy Fisher was probably like, do it again, (laughs) you know, like, try it again. Keep stressing her out. Keep putting the pressure. This is an interrogation technique. It was done in the Chris Watts case successfully. I'm glad it happened there. So I can't say that I disagree with it being used. But you should know that it is used. And you should always ask for a lawyer. And you don't have to take a polygraph. The American Polygraph Association claims that polygraphs are highly accurate with an accuracy rate above 90%. Of course they do, right? Just like, you know, Big Tobacco for the longest time said, our our product's not hurting anybody. You guys are crazy. But polygraphs are generally considered by many in the scientific and legal communities as only slightly more accurate than coin flips. And that's given them a lot. So I saw this interview with a man named Doug Williams. He administered polygraph exams for the Oklahoma City Police Department from 1972 until 1979. And he said he conducted thousands of exams. And he never once believed that polygraphs were capable of detecting deception. A polygraph is not a test. It's an intense interrogation. And the only part the polygraph plays is to frighten and intimidate a person into making a confession or an admission. It doesn't record truth or deception. There is no such thing as a lying reaction. It records nervousness. A polygraph records like physical or physiological signs, you know, your blood pressure, pulse rate, sweat activity in your hands. And we know that people who have been proven to be guilty beyond any doubt, for instance, Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, I think Ted Bundy too, they were able to pass these exams even though they were unequivocally outright lying. So like I said, I don't place too much stock in polygraph results and I don't believe that anyone should. Beverly could have been telling the truth, which is why she passed her first exam. And when she saw that they still didn't believe her and they were making her take it again, she could have become very nervous and scared. This is already like a nerve-wracking kind of situation to be in. Um, If she said that thing about, you know, this is what Nicholas does, he's always bringing me trouble. I believe she said that, but I don't think she meant it in the way like oh, I wish he was dead or I'm glad he's dead kind of way. You know, it's not like the nicest thing to say about your missing son just because you don't like that you have to take a polygraph, but it's not like illegal. It It doesn't throw up any red flags for me about criminal activity. It just kind of, you know, gives me an indication of what their relationship was like. I don't believe that Beverly was involved with what happened to Nicholas. I don't believe she even knew about it. I think she suspected it, which is probably why she and Jason were arguing so much in the weeks and months after Nicholas went missing. She probably sensed it, as a mother does, but I don't think she definitely knew, and I don't think she knows where Nicholas is now. However, Nicholas's half-brother, Jason, did not take a polygraph, and I do have some questions as to whether or not he was involved in the disappearance of his little brother. Beverly said that she didn't think Jason had hurt Nicholas, but she did admit that Jason would become a different person when he was drinking or on drugs. In her words, completely wacko and scary. She said he had even beat up his own father once. She said that if Jason did have something to do with what had happened to Nicholas, she didn't know about it. Carrie says she knows that her brother and her mother did not hurt or kill Nicholas accidentally or purposefully. And listen, I'm going to stop here because I feel bad for Carrie. I think that Carrie, out of anybody in this, clearly has no idea what's going on. I think she does not know what happened to Nicholas. And I think she genuinely convinced herself that Frederick Bourdain was Nicholas. 
at least that's what she wants us to believe, right? She wants us to believe that she genuinely believed that Frederick Bourdain was Nicholas. So I feel really bad for her. My heart breaks for her. I think she is genuinely a good person. And it kind of was stated that she was always sort of the rock and the steady one in the family, you know, when Beverly was off doing drugs and Jason was off doing drugs and drinking. Carrie was kind of keeping the family together. She was married. She had a family. She was, uh, you know, a good, upstanding citizen. She never got involved in any of that shady stuff. So I feel bad for Carrie. But what I want to say here is, Carrie, if you want us to believe that you truly thought that Frederick Bourdain was your brother Nicholas, then I really can't trust your judgment when you say you 100% believe that your brother Jason had nothing to do with what actually happened to Nicholas. Like, you can't have it both ways. You can't show us how flawed and emotionally driven your judgment is, but at the same time, you want us to take your word for it, when I do believe that your judgment on this would also be flawed and emotionally driven, right? You wanted to believe that Frederick was your brother Nicholas because you loved Nicholas. You wanted him to come home. You want us to believe that your brother Jason didn't kill Nicholas because you loved your brother Jason and you don't want his memory uh, destroyed. You don't want his reputation destroyed, especially considering he's no longer alive to defend himself. I get that. But not even considering it, not even looking at the red flags, not even looking at the facts, just because you don't want to believe that Jason did this and just because you wanted to believe that Frederick was Nicholas, it shows that you do make these decisions with your heart. And so I can't really take your word for it when you say Jason had nothing to do with Nicholas's disappearance or death, whether it was accidental or purposeful. Now, the private investigator, Charlie Parker, he's claimed that he doesn't believe Beverly had anything to do with whatever happened to Nicholas or that she even knows anything. And he said, quote, she's a good old woman. She wouldn't have known what happened, but Jason had the opportunity. But I can't openly say he did it. End quote. So Charlie Parker's kind of like on the same page as I am and probably like most of us are. And let's go back to when Nicholas was still living with his mother in San Antonio before he vanished without a trace. We know he was a bad kid. We know he skipped school. We know he was stealing. We know he was violent and he had outbursts and he ran away from home. But there was other stuff happening with Nicholas, right? Nobody's ever all good or all bad. There's different shades of gray to all of us. And Nicholas's friends at the time had noticed that Nicholas would often have unexplained bruises on his body. Nicholas's teachers had also seen these bruises, and they'd actually reported them to Child Protective Services. Could Jason have been abusing Nicholas or hurting him? Could Jason have been agitated that he had to move to San Antonio to be the caretaker of a little boy who couldn't be controlled? Was he at his wit's end with Nicholas as well? Maybe he felt that his life would be easier if his wild little half-brother was just not around anymore. Nicholas's sister, Carrie, feels that Frederick Bourdain's claims are just lies, made up to take the attention off himself and cause trouble. She says, quote, he has lied and lied and lied again. To this day, he continues to lie. He bears no remorse, end quote. But as I said at the top of this episode, if not for Frederick Bourdain, none of us would even know Nicholas's name. There's no media coverage on his disappearance, not in old newspapers, nothing. I looked. He was not written about. He was not talked about. Not until this. The investigation into Nicholas's murder was eventually called off due to lack of evidence. And in 1998, Frederick Bourdain was sentenced to six years in prison after he pleaded guilty to perjury and obtaining false documents. When he was released from custody, Bourdain continued to live the only way he knew how by pretending to be someone else. On May 3, 2005, a tourist in France called the police to report finding a 15-year-old boy alone and scared. When the child welfare officer received this young boy from the police, he was in possession of an identification card, which told them that he was Francisco Hernandez Fernandez, born in Spain. After staying silent for some time, Francisco told them that he had lost his family in a car crash, and he himself had been in a coma from that crash for weeks. And when he'd woken up, he was sent to live with an uncle who abused him. He had run away to France, the birthplace of his mother, and he had no one in the world who could care for him. Francisco was placed in a youth shelter in Pau, and after he had bathed and changed, he was examined, and several burns and scars were found on his head and body, injuries from the car accident, he said. 
He was allowed to stay at the shelter, and they enrolled him in a secondary school where he thrived, becoming best friends with another student named Raphael. The two boys would go ice skating, play video games, do their schoolwork together, and Raphael was stunned at how smart his new friend was and how quickly he learned new concepts, probably because he was not a young boy at all and had already been to school like several times. One day, Francisco showed Raphael a picture on the computer. It was a picture of a lizard. And Francisco told Raphael that this lizard was a chameleon. Within no time, Francisco was the most popular kid at school. He had charisma, his fellow students and teachers claimed. And during the school's talent show, he performed an amazing dance to a Michael Jackson song that impressed everyone. His teachers remembered thinking that he danced just like Michael Jackson. But then, the first week in June, the principal accepted a visit from a frantic teacher. She told him she'd been watching TV the night before, and she'd seen a program about a famous or infamous French imposter who pretended to be children and who was wanted by Interpol. And she swore the imposter looked just like their newest student, Francisco. Francisco was arrested, and on his right forearm, they found a tattoo that said, Chameleon Nante, or in English, the Chameleon from Nantes. So it was Frederick Bourdain again, man. <laughs> it was Frederick again. And since then, Frederick has been examined by mental health professionals who claim he's completely sane. He's not a psychopath. He's just an extremely talented actor who has the capability to transform his physical body to resemble that of a teenager to such a degree that even doctors who examined him confirmed he was, in fact, a teenager. That's crazy to me. When he was pretending to be 15-year-old Francisco, Bourdain was actually 31 years old and balding. It's crazy to me. And he said he was balding because his head had been burned in the car accident from fire. Shortly after this, though, Frederick Bourdain met a beautiful French woman named Isabel who was going to become a lawyer one day. Isabel had also gone through some childhood trauma and she was moved by Frederick's story. She felt that he truly did just want someone to love and someone to be loved by. And the two were married in 2007, and they would go on to live in France and have five children together. In 2015, Frederick Bourdain posted on Facebook, quote, I miss my old life, my freedom. Hell, I don't even have a criminal record left in France. But nothing in this world could make me abandon my wife, kids, and pets, end quote. And I mean, maybe at the end of the day, that was all Frederick Bourdain needed. An actual family, people who cared about him. The job in the newsroom at that French television show, that wasn't enough to, like, curb his wanderlust. That was just a job, not people who he depended on and who depended on him. And I do see that maybe Frederick Bourdain was a lot more like Nicholas than anyone thought. They were both considered to be troublemakers and burdensome as young boys. They both acted out in response to a lack of something that every child needs, unconditional love, acceptance, and boundaries, safety, consistency. They would both run away when they were faced with something they didn't know how to cope with because no one had ever cared enough to teach them coping skills. They were both misunderstood. They were both left to their own devices and unheard. Now, something I want to point out is Frederick Bourdain has said often, you know, the best liars contain the truth within their lies. It's the truth prettied up and wrapped up in lies. That is the best way to lie and get away with it. And this is absolutely true. So I do think that a lot of his stories of who he was and his identities, they had the truth inside. The abuse that he claimed happened when he was Nicholas, the abuse that he claimed happened when he was Francisco um, by the hands of his uncle. I think that Frederick was most likely heavily sexually and physically abused as a child. Clearly, I believe he was mentally and emotionally abused too by his mother and most likely by his grandfather and who knows who else. So I do think that there was a lot of trauma and a lot of abuse in his background and he used that to to create these different personalities and these different characters because he knew that these were things he could talk about because he had experienced them. He may have been talking about these experiences under the guise of somebody else, but they were still things he understood and could discuss. Most likely not to the extent that he was claiming happened to him when he was in Spain and being held by like this trafficking ring and stuff. Most likely not to that extent. And that's why the forensic psychiatrist was like, no, I didn't see the same changes in his 
physical or his physiological um, body to suggest that he had been through this kind of trauma that he was describing. But definitely he went through some kind of trauma. And he also made it very clear, Frederick, that you have to be very careful not to lose yourself in these characters, right? That could be very dangerous. And I think when he was being Nicholas, he did end up losing himself because not only did he pretend to be Nicholas, but everyone believed it around him so wholeheartedly that it probably screwed with him mentally. He was probably like, hold up, like, am I Nicholas? Am I actually Nicholas? What the heck's going on? It's like gaslighting, you know, to some extent. When somebody, you know, tells you something over and over again, even if you don't believe it's true, if they keep saying it and if enough people keep saying it, you start to be convinced that what you're hearing about yourself is true, even though you know yourself better than anyone. You will get manipulated. And I think that he really kind of lost himself. And that's why he started cutting his face. That's why he started hurting himself. That's why he started acting out, taking the car, driving, things like that. Since Beverly Dollarhide moved out of the house she'd been living in when Nicholas went missing, it was occupied by new tenants. The man who now lived there told Charlie Parker that his dog was always digging in one corner of the lawn, and he never knew why. But one day, when he was mowing the lawn, he saw what looked like pieces of plastic sticking out of the ground. But when he tried to pull it out, it just kept ripping and it wouldn't come out, which suggests, obviously, that there's something, like, heavy under there. It's not just a piece of plastic covered by some dirt. It's, like, a piece of plastic with something heavy on it or under it or wrapped in it, and you can't pull it up. The documentary, the one I've been talking about, Imposter, which you can find on Tubi, it ends with a scene of Charlie Parker digging in that corner of the yard. But we never get to see if he found anything. I personally suspect he did not, or else we would have heard about it by now because this documentary came out in like 2016 or something. But I don't think that anybody would have been dumb enough to bury Nicholas in that backyard, in like your own backyard? Absolutely not. But I still can't stop wondering what happened to the real Nicholas Barclay. If it wasn't someone in his family, then he must have been abducted by someone else, a stranger, which we know is far less common than something happening to him at the hands of someone he knew. There's no way, there's no way that a 13-year-old boy with no money, no clothes, and no identification could have survived this long without making himself known to someone somewhere. So I decided to look into kidnappings in the San Antonio area around that time that Nicholas went missing to see if there were like similarities. I did find something interesting. On August 4th, 1990, 11-year-old Heidi Seaman was walking home from her friend's house after spending the night, but she never made it home. And on August 23rd, seven-year-old Erica Botello was playing outside of her San Antonio apartment complex with her father. He went inside for a few minutes. When he came back out, she'd vanished. Two days later, the bodies of both Heidi and Erica were found miles apart from each other. Both cases remain unsolved to this day. But while I was looking into this case, I also came across another name, Tommy Lynn Sells, also known as the Cross County Killer and the Coast to Coast Killer. Authorities believed he killed 22 people, and Sells has claimed to have killed over 70. And as I was looking at his victims, his past, etc., I thought, you know, this could possibly be someone who may have been connected to what happened to Nicholas Barclay. However, reportedly, Sells was in prison from 1992 to 1997 after he was charged for raping, beating, and stabbing a young woman. He was sentenced to 10 years, but he only served five because, you know, his victim didn't die. Never mind that he clearly intended for her to die, but five years seems like an appropriate response to what he did to her. <laughs> oh, say it with me now. Our justice system is broken. Honestly, I would like to see a more official record for where Sells was in 1994 because I only saw in a an online article that he was in prison during that time because he was linked to many murders, um, including many young people, a nine-year-old girl from San Antonio. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if there's a connection, but it's something. You know, I just don't want to go down this path like, yes, Jason definitely did this to Nicholas. I don't want to just automatically go down that path because it could be not true. And that's why I wanted to explore other options more. But if you think about it, you know, what could have possibly happened to him? Nicholas definitely encountered foul play. Was it someone who he knew, a trusted adult perhaps, like a coach or a teacher or a neighbor? 
or another family member, like an aunt or an uncle? Did he come across a stranger with nefarious intentions and this stranger was just driving around and he saw a cute, toe-headed kid with sparkling blue eyes walking alone, small for his age, wearing these, like, (laughs) eye-catching, bright purple pants with a bright pink backpack slung across his shoulder? You know, maybe Nicholas was a victim of opportunity. Maybe this nefarious stranger was just driving through town, saw Nicholas, decided to seize that opportunity. I don't know. Um, I definitely think that Jason knew more than what he was saying. I think it's a strong possibility that Jason was probably involved with whatever happened to Nicholas. Honestly, I don't even know if the police interviewed the kids who were supposedly at the basketball court with Nicholas that day, you know, to ask them, like, when did you get there? When did he get there? Did you see any, like, strange people around watching you? I don't know if they did that. I I hope so, but considering the lackluster bullshit police response in this case, it's possible that they didn't, right? It's possible that they didn't. I don't know if they checked, like, if there's video cameras or surveillance on businesses at this point. I don't know what they did, honestly, to, to help locate this kid. It doesn't seem like much, and it doesn't seem like anybody's looking for him anymore today. And that makes me incredibly sad. And so I hope that people are. And I hope if you're listening to this and you live in the San Antonio area or you see someone who looks like Nicholas, I'm going to put up an age-progressed picture of him, somebody that maybe resembles him or you've talked to somebody who knows something or who said a story similar to this, please come forward and and say something because I would really love for Nicholas's disappearance to be resolved. For him, not for anybody else, for him, because he deserves that. He was a young kid. He didn't have a chance. Man, he didn't have a chance. He was kind of born into bad circumstances. There was nobody there to really guide him from a young age. And that's why some people in the comment section really pissed me off with this last video because they're like, you're so judgmental. You're so judgmental. Uh, Sometimes you can't do anything with a bad kid. A kid wouldn't be bad if he was taught to be good, you know, from a young age. Like, you can't pretty much just have a kid and do nothing with it. Like, you can't just let it be and like, oh, he's just going to grow into a great person. You have to teach them. You have to mold them. You have to guide them every step of the way from beginning on, you know, from like day of birth on. You've really got to do your best to like teach the kid to be good because people don't just know to be good organically by themselves you know humans are going to try to get away with all sorts of shit you are the person as the adult as the parent responsible for like guiding your child and teaching them the difference between right and wrong so no by 13 if you're acting out like yeah maybe by 13 there was nothing that could be done he needed to go to juvie he really needed therapy let's be honest right nicholas barclay needed therapy he needed somebody to give a shit and bring him to somebody who could help not just throw up their hands and be like ah juvie it is for you because you keep acting up he needed therapy but maybe at that point, yeah, he was, he was you know, pretty far gone. But leading up to that point, there was a lot that could have been done. Ain't no five-year-old out there just being a complete asshole for no reason. And there ain't no 13-year-old out there being an asshole for no reason. So that's how I feel about that. And I'm not going to change my mind about that at all. It's like scientifically proven. So I'm not judgmental. I'm just honest and realistic about life. But now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that Nicholas's family, they know more than they're saying? Do you think Jason took his own life rather than be subjected to an investigation into the whereabouts of his little brother? Do you think Frederick Bourdain just made everything up to distract from his own wrongdoings? Do you think it's possible that everyone believed Frederick was Nicholas against their better judgment, against what they knew in their brains because they wanted him to be Nicholas so badly? I know that we can often convince ourselves of a lot if we want to, but everybody, I guess, like, that's what's getting me. Like, I get Carrie, maybe even Beverly, but, like, everybody, I guess the kids were too young. Um, Carrie's Carrie's kids, they were too young when Nicholas went missing to really know the difference. But you got, like, Carrie's husband, Carrie, Beverly, probably, like, the teachers at the school who were like, yeah, this kid looks 16. Like, everybody was kind of like convincing themselves of what objectively can be seen to be not true? I don't know. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments. 
Thank you for being here with me for this series. Thank you for being here with me today and in general. Uh, make sure you subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, hit that bell notification so YouTube notifies you when I post a video. They still might not, but at least we know we're doing everything we can. YouTube hates me. Also, don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Follow me on social media, Twitter and Instagram. Links are in the description box. But when he was five, Frederick moved with his grandparents to Mouchamps. Is that how you pronounce it? Probably not. That's not how you pronounce it. How to pronounce Mouchamps. Mouchamps? Come on. That can't be how you pronounce it. That's terrible. Mouchamps? It can't be. It can't be. That is the most ugly word ever. Let's try again. Let's try a different website. Play. Mushin? That's completely... No. Dude, for real? I'm gonna look for that guy on YouTube who's always like, This is how you pronounce this. Nope. Okay. Mouchamps it is. Damn. That... I don't even want to say that. Mouchamps? I thought it was like Mouchamps. Mao Champs. Okay, we're gonna go with that. We're gonna go with that. When he was five, Frederick moved with his grandparents to Mao Champs outside Mao Champs. Ah. Also, don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Follow me on social media, Twitter and Instagram. Links are in the description box. Also, don't forget to follow my podcast, Crime Weekly. Links in the description box. And if you want to buy some of my coffee, Criminal Coffee Company, we're now shipping to Canada, even though shipping is outrageous <laughs> to Canada. That is nothing we can control. Uh, shipping is just crazy right now. We do not control the price of shipping. And we know it's ridiculously expensive, but we wanted to be able to offer it to people in Canada in case they wanted to take us up on it. And hopefully shipping comes down soon. Probably not. <laughs> but um, yeah, check out Criminal Coffee Company if you want to taste the best coffee in the whole entire world. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye. Straight down And that river runs deep The mouths get steep And the voice is getting too loud Oh, this feeling's out of baby It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say your hell Mary But you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly And so you got To let it go I got blood